Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to this evening's discussion with uh, Liz Cheney. She's, uh, she's here, of course, to, to, to talk about her important new book, Oath and Honor, a Memoir and a Warning. Uh, I'm Brad Graham, a co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And, uh, uh, and, and whether, whether you're, you're here with us in person or watching virtually from home, and I was told there are several hundred, actually, uh, tuning in this evening. Um, on behalf of, of PNP and our partner Six and I, uh, thank you so much for participating tonight and for supporting both uh, an independent bookstore and this um, um, vital nonprofit institution uh, here in the center of the nation's capital. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the historic building uh, that, uh, that we're in, uh, it has served uh, for the past 19 years as a center for arts, uh, entertainment, ideas, and Jewish life. Under the leadership of CEO Heather Moran, Sixth and I aims through a mix of experiences to embrace a wide range of participants and bring inspiration and meaning to their lives. Uh, we in PMP uh, love this place uh, because, as you can see, uh, it's a wonderfully spacious and elegant venue for author talks. A few weeks uh, from today will mark the third anniversary of the January 6th assault on the Capitol. Uh, just six blocks from where we are now, a mob sought to disrupt the certification of the presidential election and prevent the peaceful transfer of power, a violent act without parallel in American history. Following the attack, Liz Cheney, uh, then a member of Congress representing Wyoming since 2017, was one of just 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump for inciting the insurrection. And she was uh, uh, one of only two Republicans subsequently to serve on the special House committee that investigated the January attack. Uh, putting democracy and country before party uh, she paid a political price. First, she was removed as chair of the House Republican Congress, the third highest position in the House Republican leadership. Then the Republican National Committee uh, censored her. And later, Wyoming Republicans uh, refused to reelect her. Uh, even more stunning than Liz Cheney's strength and courage in speaking uh, the truth about Trump in the face of such political consequences is how rare such attributes have been among her former Republican colleagues uh, on the Hill. In Oath and Honor, she shares her own account of the insurrection and its aftermath and reflects on, on this uh, perilous, perilous period in our nation's history and the risks that still imperil American democracy. Moderating this evening's conversation will be a veteran journalist and renowned chronicler of Washington's power elite, Mark Leibovich. Mark is a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine and has written several books of his own, including the bestsellers of This Town a decade ago, and last year, Thank You for Your Servitude. Plus, he's a political analyst for, um, for NBC and uh, MSNBC. Uh, later in the program, uh, we'd love to hear your questions, and you'll be invited to line up at the microphones on, uh, uh, on either aisle. Uh, please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Liz Cheney and Mark Leibovich.
You're standing, Liz. Wow. You could, uh, you could probably be elected some, you know, to Congress from the District of Columbia if they had representation. So. Don't answer that. Don't yeah, say anything. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Mark Leibovich, as Brad said. It's an honor to be here talking to Liz Cheney. Uh, I have some news to break. Um, as of a, about an hour or so ago, she was uh, listed at number one. She debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Which is a beautiful thing. Uh, she's been topping the charts at Amazon the last um, 10 days or so or for a while, but we don't mention Amazon because we support independent bookstores. And everyone, if you haven't bought the book yet, buy it from Politics and Prose um, and screw Amazon. Um, or, but if you need to, buy the book from Amazon, too. Um, uh, just before we get started, I was walking over here and I told my mother I was coming to uh, Sixth and I Synagogue to talk to Liz Cheney, and my mother said, Liz Cheney's Jewish? <laughs> I, I didn't think I could love her anymore. So, um, yeah, so she's part of your base, too. She's a Democrat from Massachusetts. So. Um, anyway, I read the book. It's a great book. Everyone should read the book. I'm a huge evangelist for the book and um, we're gonna get into a lot of the stuff in here. Um, I've watched a lot of Liz's interviews. I'm gonna try to get, some, get into some things that she hasn't gotten into yet. But I guess what I would ask you first, Liz, is you've been out of Congress for a while. You've obviously been working on this book for, for a while. You've written books before. What has this experience been like over the last two weeks? Uh, over the last two weeks? Two weeks, well, first of all, having the book come out, but just having it enter the world and having the response and sort of seeing how it has been digested and received. Uh, well, first of all, th thank you for being here. Thank you for doing this. Um, thank you to uh, Politics and Prose and uh, to Sixth and I. It's wonderful to be back. Last time I was here was for the Henry Winkler event a few weeks ago, which was wonderful. Um, I also want to mention a few people in the audience. Uh, my husband, Phil, is here, and um, if you have read the book, um, you will know what a what a hugely important role Phil played as uh, someone with decades of experience as a litigator and having served on investigative committees and at some of the highest levels in the Justice Department and federal agencies and, and Phil's role and all we were able to do on the select committee um, is, uh, was, was just absolutely, um, couldn't have happened without him. So um, very <laughs> proud that he's here. And uh, my daughter Elizabeth is also here. Elizabeth just finished her, her last exam of the year. She's a second year law student, so very pleased she's celebrating this way. <laughs> and I um, also want to recognize there are a number of um, members of um, my congressional staff who are here. Um, these are men and women who were with me on January 6th. Um, and, and before, and who stayed with me after. And you can imagine what it was like to be a Liz Cheney staffer uh, among the Republicans on Capitol Hill throughout the course of everything that happened. So maybe I could just ask them to stand up. I know, I think they're all sitting back here, so. <laughs> And now I forgot the question. Now, um. <laughs> I, I just want to say that this is, these are unusually raucous applause for a synagogue. I, I, am, I am really impressed so far. Um, I remember. <laughs> so um, I, I guess by way of current events, um, I want to touch a few bases on just the last few days. Starting with today, um, your former colleagues uh, looked like they have launched a 
what, impeachment inquiry of President Biden. Um, I guess I would ask you, do you have any idea why? <laughs> or what do you think of this? Um, some of them don't seem to have any idea why. Yeah, I would um, say. And it, it's, I, I say that it's, you know, with some seriousness. I yeah. think if you look just a couple of weeks ago, um, Speaker Johnson said, you know, that there just simply wasn't the evidence there to go forward. So I'm wondering exactly what's changed in the last few weeks. Um, and, and I do think, you know, they owe the American people transparency. Right. And if they're going to go forward on an impeachment inquiry, which I, I guess they voted to do so, um, they, ought to, they ought to put the evidence out there. Um, a couple of days ago, Jack Smith um, asked the Supreme Court to basically expedite the, the idea that, basically litigate the idea right off the bat that Donald Trump was not liable for anything, and it sounds like they're going to take it. What did you think of that development, and, and what do you think the chances are that that, that will be um, decided? Um, I think, you know, the notion that a uh, former president um, enjoys some sort of, you know, blanket immunity from criminal prosecution uh, for, you know, crimes that he committed while president is, is clearly wrong. And I don't, I don't think it's a close call. Um, it, it looks to me like special counsel did the right thing and, and made clear that, that, you know, Donald Trump's efforts to try to delay this uh, are going to be met with a very responsible and clear uh, approach from the special counsel, and we'll see. We'll see what the Supreme Court does. I guess the, they've said that, that Trump has got to file his brief by next week. By next but week, right. but I, I I don't think it's a close call. Do, do you think? How do you think in general? I mean, I guess t take Jack Smith specifically, because obviously there are a lot of prosecutors involved in a lot of jurisdictions. How do you think these issues have mo have been? litigated in the legal realm? Because you sort of left off as an investigator when you left Congress or when the January 6th commission disbanded. Um, how have you seen that proceeding from the outside as a lawyer, as someone who knows the facts of this case better than almost anyone? It, it's a really, it's interesting because um, when we were working on the select committee, uh, you know, going into it, it was clear that we had to have an aggressive litigation strategy. And one of the things that we saw was sort of a reflexive, and, and I think both parties do this, but there was a, a reflexive um, approach sometimes by Democratic staffers to make assumptions about how judges would rule if they had been appointed by Republican presidents, right. and Republicans do the same thing. And um, so, you know, we were getting advice that you shouldn't, you shouldn't expect that you're going to be able to get these issues resolved quickly, um, but we, we did in historic fashion and, and on a, a very expedited timetable. I also think that um, before we really began to be engaged in our investigation, uh, it was clear the Justice Department was moving very quickly on um, the prosecutions of people who had invaded the Capitol. Um, of people you might think of as the foot soldiers. But they had not, uh, as far as we could tell, begun to look uh, you know, all the way up to the top. And I, I do think our investigation played a really important role in uncovering evidence and in many of us on the committee, all of us, continuing to make the point that um, there has to be accountability all the way up to the top. Um, if we want to make sure nothing like that ever happens again. Uh, speaking of which, there was... Yeah. I, I would say hold your applause to the end, but just applaud whenever you want. Um, the, uh, there was a decision today, or, or there was some guidance today from the Supreme Court that was very arcane because I, don't, I haven't read it closely, but some people close to Trump were taking it as a quasi if not legal victory, at least a, an indication that you know Donald Trump might benefit. I'm wondering if you could um, tell tell us a little more about what, how you responded to this. Um, so the the court has agreed to uh, grant cert to hear the case of one of the January 6 rioters um, who was convicted of a number of things, but one of which was uh, a violation of Section 1512 
C2, uh, which is obstruction of an official proceeding. And um, the court agreed to, you know, to hear his appeal, essentially. Um, and this is also one of the statutes under which we made criminal referrals for Donald Trump uh, and for which he's been charged by the uh, special counsel, uh, indicted by the Justice Department. And so there are some Trump people who are sort of saying, well, the Supreme Court has said they're going to review this issue around 1512C. And I think one of the things that's really important to remember is um, that Donald Trump is in a different category than, than this particular rioter. Um, the question does become sort of an arcane legal one, but an important one about whether or not um, Trump was engaged in obstruction of an official proceeding with respect to documents. There's a discussion about whether or not this part of the code applies to um, to, to the documents, to fraudulent documents, to the destruction of documents. And whereas this rioter um, himself is making a claim that that doesn't apply to him, no matter how the court ends up ruling on that, Donald Trump himself is obviously directly involved um, in the fake elector scheme, which was all about the submission of fraudulent documents to the government, the use of those fraudulent documents to prevent the counting of the legitimate certified electoral votes. Right. So I think it's important for people to recognize the distinction and, you know, to, to take with a, I say a grain of salt, like with a whole container of salt, what the Trump people are saying uh, about this decision to grant cert. Right. Um, when we were waiting in the wings, I just sort of asked you, are you still a Republican, Liz? And you said, yeah, and your body language was, seemed less than enthusiastic. Um, I'm going to ask you the follow-up question, or maybe I, I don't know if I asked this. Are you, why are you still a Republican? Well, I'm not sure that you actually portrayed accurately my response. I'm sorry. Um, okay, that's fine. I'll let you portray it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I said I'm not a Trump Republican. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, and I, you said that was like a shocker. I was, yeah, bro yeah breaking news. I, <laughs> I didn't want to jump, I didn't want to step on the, the right. number one bestseller list. <laughs> Um, look, I, um, the Republican Party of today is, is not a party that re reflects my views in terms of the Constitution. And um, when I watch how far they've moved away from um, what I think is the most conservative of conservative values, which is mm -hmm. fidelity to the Constitution, um, you know, I... Uh, it's hard to see a fit. I think the party is going to have to fundamentally rebuild, which I don't know if that's possible, or we're going to have to start a new party. Uh, but starting a new party, in my view, is something that has to happen after 24, mm -hmm. because it, it takes focus and attention away from beating Donald Trump, and that's what we have to do this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what do you make of, I mean, this kind of drives me crazy, but what, what do you make of, there are a lot of seemingly very critical of Donald Trump Republicans out there, and then you ask, okay, so what are you doing in November of 2024? And they say, I will support the nominee. Um, you know, s some people will say, I'm not voting for Donald Trump, I'm going to write in, you know, Ronald Reagan or something like that. Uh, what do you think when you see that? I mean, you know, I... <laughs> Well, I don't even know where to start. So I would say, first of all, I do think what happens is you get, sometimes you get politicians who sort of operate, this will surprise you, operate on autopilot. Like, wow. I know. It's a, yeah, amazing. Like breaking so much news tonight. It's really. amazing, right? Um, yeah. but, but, you know, and so there's this automatic, I'm going to support the nominee of my party. And what's been so surprising to me is how few political leaders have broken out of that, how few political leaders have realized you, you can't support somebody who tried to seize power and who has said he'll do it again right. um, and still say that you're faithful to the Constitution. But, and so, the, and the other problem with what, what those kinds of elected officials are doing is voters around the country, you know, often I will have Republicans say to me, how can it be as bad as you say if nobody else or very few other people are saying it. 
Right. And so there's a real need for leadership for people to understand that there's no gray area here. Like you, you can't support him if you say that you support the Constitution. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's true. I mean, when you talk about, I mean, there are some Republicans, in fairness, who say they will not support the nominee if that nominee is Donald Trump or if the nominee has is guilty of a felony. So who could we possibly be talking about in that case? Um, what, what is the proper answer then? Because one of two people is gonna be elected president, the Republican nominee or the Democratic nominee. Um, I mean, unless I'm wrong, I mean, if you're not gonna support the de Republican nominee if it's Donald Trump, you're supporting the Democratic nominee who in all likelihood is Joe Biden. I mean, am I right about this? I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Well, we don't, but there seems to be a very good chance. Well, look, I think that um, we don't know uh, who the nominee is going to be on the Republican side. It's very likely going to be Trump. Mm -hmm. I, we don't know who the nominee is going to be on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. It's very likely going to be Biden. Um, but I also think that, that it's too soon to be able to say, look, you know, if you're not for this person, you're definitely for that person. Uh, it's not going to be a two-person race, uh, no matter you know what decisions people like me and some others make in the next couple of months. Um, you've already got multiple candidates in the race, mm -hmm. and we have to. The the stakes matter. They're so high mm -hmm. that, in my view, we have to be able to give people confidence that. We're going to pull together Republicans, Democrats, independents, um, that we're going to look beyond partisanship. And if we have learned anything in the last couple of years, it's that this is not politics as usual. So, like, I've been around almost as long as you have. Um. <laughs> wow. We're, we're fairly close in age. But then, my dad was not the vice president. That is. Mark, we have a funny story, actually, many funny stories about when uh, Dick Cheney kicked the New York Times reporter off the plane. <laughs> it wasn't was, me. <laughs> it wasn't, yeah. Um, but, but the, um, so I just think that the tectonic plates of our politics are shifting, and I don't think we can say, you know, you're going to either have to cast a vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden, and you have to decide right now that you're going to vote for Joe Biden. I think you could say... For sure, you're not voting for Donald Trump, but I don't think we know what the alternative is going to be. Okay. So I, I'm pretty sure you're not going to vote for Cornell West or Robert F. Kennedy Jr. or Jill Stein, um, the no labels candidate, if there is one, or are you still technically a politician who can't answer hypothetical questions? I, I first of all, my endorsement of people on the Republican side right now will probably hurt people. Right. Um, no, it's true. I yeah. mean, yeah. Um, and so, no, I'm not going to endorse anybody here tonight. And, and, and again, I think it's really true that we don't know what the field's going to look like. Yeah. What, what do you think of the campaign? You sound skeptical. You're skeptical of what? You sound skeptical oh, of my sound, answer. No, I think, I, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, your endorsement, I mean, all due respect, I, I don't think it's going to win anyone any Republican votes in the current landscape. But I actually am curious... Um, I mean, the Christie campaign, which doesn't seem to be going anywhere, but he's been pretty, by far, the clearest um, messenger for the kinds of things you've been talking about. What, what have you, uh, what, what's your response been to how he's been, how he's been doing? I have a, a lot of respect for what Governor Christie's doing. And I think that, um, you know, when you, when you look and you see, you know, the last debate it was four candidates, before that it was eight or however many it was, um, and when candidates are asked, will you support Donald Trump even if he's convicted of a felony, uh, and basically all of them raise their hands except for Chris Christie and I think at that point Asa Hutchinson, um, you know, that, that is, uh, that's dangerous. And, and so I think, you know, we're at a place where we can either decide uh, that people are going to just kind of go along and fall, fall in line because it's the easiest, most comfortable path to take, or you can decide we have to do what's right for the country. And that means that you've got to say, look, what's right for the country is to have the very best possible candidates on the field running for president. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't have those yet. Right. Right. 
One of the things I really enjoyed about the book, um, as someone who follows politics very closely and, and Congress actually pretty closely, is I wanted to see what you would say about some of your old colleagues. You did not, I, I thought, I was surprised even, shouldn't have been surprised, but you really laid it, let it all, laid it all you, you left it all out on the field about Kevin McCarthy. Um, you were extremely blunt about your feelings about him the dereliction um, that, that he brought to his job. I mean, you obviously, I'm assuming you're not talking to him on any regular basis these days, but <laughs> get, given how his speakership went and how it ended up, um, I mean, do you think it was worth it for him? You know, I... Um, I know, I'd have to ask him. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But I, I think that it's not surprising mm -hmm. where the whole thing ended up. Um, I think it's it, the fact that, you know, even now in the last few days, he's saying that he's going to support Donald Trump and he'd really like to be in Donald Trump's cabinet. I mean, like how many times, right. you know, is Donald Trump going to take a him. shot at right. you and you're going to crawl back? I mean, that's, it is, um, it's, it's sort of, it's pathetic, but, mm -hmm. um, that's my diplomatic term <laughs> point. No, um, no, I mean, it really is, though. I mean, you, you've always been, I and mean, you're, you know, you study history. Um, and one of the things that has always struck me about talking to some of these folks is you ask them, you know, do you worry about what the verdict of history will be on you? And I, I asked McCarthy specifically this, and he looked at me like he just rolled his eyes. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like I was some kind of Pollyannish, you know, who thinks about this stuff. And I guess as someone who studies history and who has invoked, you know, how historians will look upon this time and the character of, of certain actors, I mean, do you worry that, that, you know, history has become cheapened by the fact that so much information now has become just so partisan or so cheapened by some of the messengers? Well, I think that that we have a real problem in this country in terms of not teaching American history, right. and um, and and if you and, you know that that doesn't mean to you know glorify our history and say that we're perfect because we certainly aren't, but it you know I think all of us regardless of party, ought to want our kids to study the lives of great people, ought to want our kids to study leaders and to understand the mistakes, but also to understand what it took to succeed in the past. And, um, and so uh, I think that if you asked every member of Congress, if you said to them, hey, listen, if you have to choose between your political survival or defending the Constitution, what would you choose? All of them will tell you we're going to defend the Constitution. Right. And what was one of the most uh, surprising and also heartbreaking things to me was how few did. That, right. that actually, and, and sort of what happens is you say, well, you know, I'm going to make sure I survive politically, and then you start to rationalize why that really wasn't what you did, but, right. but sure. that is really what happened. I mean, and also history, we're not talking about like a course curriculum in a school. We're talking about the day-to-day. -day. I mean, you were living history. We are all living history. And, you know, if you watch Fox all the time, um, in all likelihood, you're going to think the insurrection was not, um, you know, was not real, was not Donald Trump's fault, you know, that vaccines or, you know, go down the list, right? Um, how much, I mean, I guess one question I would ask is, how much responsibility does the outlets like Fox and Newsmax and, I don't know, uh, what's the other one? OM, what is it? OAM. Yeah, just go down that list. I mean, how much of it is an information problem, ultimately? Um, it's a, it's a, they have a big responsibility. And, uh, you know, I, I talk in the book about uh, the day after the impeachment vote, um, and thinking about, all right, what do we have to do to begin to try to bring people back from the brink and to begin to try to um, convey it to Republicans that the election really wasn't stolen. And uh, I called Paul Ryan and said, listen, you know, I th we, we talked about what we could do and, and 
the idea we discussed was that Fox News could produce a show of some kind that was sort of a documentary that explained right. why the election wasn't stolen. Yes. Paul Ryan's on the board of Fox. Right, just right. Um, and he agreed uh, mm. and uh, told me uh, relatively soon after that that he'd talked to the management at Fox, that they agreed it was a good idea. And then the show never happened. And I heard later that you know it had been at some stage of the production uh, and it was stopped. And you know, when you think about the comparison between Fox's approach to that, the approach, the reported approach to that, and the approach they took to Tucker Carlson's horrible show called Patriot Purge, which was, you know, intentional lies about January 6th and about what had happened. And they did air that. They aired it on their streaming service. And that, it, you know, it, and then, of course, you look at what's come to light through some of the emails and text messages both the select committee uncovered. And maybe I'll just say a word about that. I mean, if you look, for example, at January 7th, the text messages between Sean Hannity and Kaylee McEnany, who was then the communications director at the White House, you know, and there, Sean Hannity is texting Kaylee saying, like, you know, basically, all right, this is what we need to do. You know, the 25th Amendment, impeachment, those are very real. Uh, no more crazy people. So they're, they're trying to isolate the president. They understand they can't have him have access to, to the people they call crazy. Now I would note that those people they call crazy are now the people that Donald Trump says he's gonna populate a second term with. They're, they're mm -hmm. around him all the time. But, but these Fox News hosts, and there are others mm -hmm. who were texting on January 6th, they knew what was happening, they knew how dangerous it was, they knew the election wasn't stolen. Some of their text messages and emails come to light in the Dominion case. Um, and, and the damage that, that they've done, and it's not just them, it's the others that you mentioned too, but the damage that's done when you have people pushing these lies uh, and echoing and magnifying this idea that somehow you know, there's been this massive rigging of the election and, and that people have to fight to take back their country. It's, it is really dangerous. I mean, you, you obviously have a lot of respect for Paul Ryan. I mean, to my knowledge, he's still on the board, right? I mean, should he? I think he is. I mean, should he not be? Well, he, I mean, he's got to make that decision. He does. Uh, what do you think that should say? Well, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, I mean, it, no, I, I agree. And, and, you know, Paul Ryan, I think, in many ways was a force for, for good and for common sense. And, um, you know, you, you take the allies you can, I guess. One thing I would ask um, you, as you mentioned, the next administration, I mean, the, the part of this book that is a warning, um, I mean, you can imagine what that could look like. Uh, we talked about checks and balances. And in fact, you specifically talked about checks and balances in a Wall Street Journal op-ed that just posted about an hour ago. So after you order the book, um, read that op-ed. But, but talk a little bit about how you know, if Donald Trump wants Mike Flynn to be his Secretary of Defense or something like that, how he would use or how he would how he would sort of circumvent Senate confirmation or or the kinds of oversight that the House and the Senate would typically bring to bear on nominations like that. Yeah, it's a it's a really important point um, because of the arguments that are being made right now, especially um, by Republicans who. That would suggest, well, listen, you know, even if um, Trump were to be elected again, the country has these checks and balances that will prevent him from, you know, actually being able to unravel the republic. And um, there are a lot of problems with that argument. The first thing I would point out is that, you know, the response that many Republicans have had to the last couple of weeks, the Atlantic had a huge series about the dangers of a second term. There's been talk about the country sleepwalking into, into dictatorship. And you don't really hear um, Republican elected officials responding to that by saying, well, by defending Trump. They don't say Trump didn't actually try to seize the last election. They don't say he didn't actually sit and watch while the Capitol was being invaded. They, they, don't, they don't go there. What they are saying is, 
no, 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 he couldn't possibly be a dictator because we have these checks and balances to protect right. or us. Or he was kidding or, or whatever. Yeah. He was not kidding. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think what's important is that people really stop and think about what are those checks and balances. Mm -hmm. The checks and balances are, first, the separation of powers. It's Congress, and it's, it's the courts. So then you say to yourself, all right, well, who's in Congress today who's going to stop Donald Trump? Josh Hawley? No. Ted Cruz? No. J.D. Vance, Mike Lee, they're not going to stop Trump. Right. Um, and over on the House side, Mike Johnson, the Republicans in charge, they're not going to stand up to Donald Trump. And so then you start thinking about, well, you know, Congress's ability to check a president and to stand against a president comes in a number of ways. Number one, possible impeachment and conviction. Um, they're not going to do that. Uh, you could say, well, the Senate has the ability to confirm nominees, so he can't nominate the craziest people. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't care if he, his nominees get Senate confirmation. He'll put people in as acting. He's done that before. Um, and so you can't count on Congress to be able to stop a second Trump presidency, just stop him if he were elected again. Um, and then you look at the courts, and, you know, Courts authority, the orders of courts um, really matter um, and mean something and have power because a president, a chief executive enforces them. So, you know, you can imagine a situation where in a second Trump term, Donald Trump decides he's going to declare an emergency and maybe declare an insurrection, perhaps say the elections have to be postponed. Um, and I hear people say, well, if he ever tried that, of course, you know, the courts would step in. But who's going to enforce those orders? And so I think the idea that a second Donald Trump term um, isn't dangerous falls apart pretty quickly when you walk through the facts. And, and the point that you're making, which is one of the things we saw very clearly in the select committee hearings was the people who stopped him. Um, the Republican officials who tried to stop him, the Republican officials who stood against him, uh, will not be there in a second term. Right. And they've been very public. You know, you're not, you're not going to have Pat Cipollone as White House counsel, right. uh, or Jeff Clark, uh, or Richard Donahue at the Jeff Justice Clark. Department. Um, right. you're not Jeff Clark, Jeff Rosen yeah. uh, at the Justice Department. You might have Jeff Clark you might at have the Justice Jeff Clark. Department. Yeah, absolutely. He, yeah. he may be otherwise occupied, yeah. but yeah. You, you might have him. Um, <laughs> um, but but yeah. no, I, I think it's it's the Mike Flynn example is very important to I mean, people I mean, to understand. Well, and also, I mean, people, we haven't talked much about pardon power, but you, you have a feel. I have a feeling that you you can imagine day one he'll he'll start pardoning, you know, a lot of the January six people. Um, you know, maybe like whoever attacked. Paul Pelosi. I mean, you know, you could, anyone who he perceives to be an ally to his cause, I mean, it could be open season. I mean, is there anything that it could be done legislatively now or even from the executive branch that could possibly um, tweak the pardon power of the office or is it too late? No, I mean, I, I think that, that constitutionally the pardon power, um, you know, really does rest with the president. And I think there would be constitutional. Uh, challenges if, if there was an attempt made. And I think it would, it would you know, be very problematic were another branch to try to step in. Right. But I think that the danger of the pardon power is even more than what you're suggesting because imagine a situation where you know, a court does issue a compulsory order, Trump decides not to enforce it or, or obey it, and if he's got people in his administration who feel uncomfortable about that, you know, he can just offer pardons. Sure. Just do, do what I want and don't worry, I'll pardon you. So I think one of the most important lessons of what happened on January 6th and in the days leading up to it is that America's institutions don't defend themselves. It takes people to do that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, And, and who we elect really matters. Um, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I've been curious to get your response to this. I, I've been sort of um, thinking a lot about the period in Washington between January 6th and January 20th, which was one of the scariest periods I've ever lived through here, and any of us have. Not only were there, you know, 
National Guards, people in the streets, COVID was still happening. But, you know, the, the biggest threat to our, our safety seemed to be still sitting in the White House. I'm wondering if you could compare that to what it was like after 9-11, uh, which was an equally scary time, or different, very different, but it was a scary time in Washington. You didn't know where our enemies were. You didn't know what they were capable of. Uh, you didn't know what you were dealing with. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what those two really acute periods in our history, both of which you've lived through very, very intimately, uh, were like and, and how you sort of remember the, both of them. Um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously on 9-11, 3,000 Americans were killed. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it's important to remember that distinction. Yeah. Um, however, you know, I, I went back and I looked at what President Bush said from the Oval Office on the night of September 11th, mm -hmm. 2001. And um, in his speech, what he said was that the terrorists can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundations of our democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to recognize that what Donald Trump did to this country um, and what he's still trying to do to this country certainly does damage and could potentially unravel, um, destroy the foundations of our democracy. Um, and so I think, yes, those two periods, you know, there, there were moments when I saw the video of Vice President Pence being rushed down the steps of the Capitol um, on January 6th. I immediately thought of, a, there's a photo of my dad being rushed down the steps in the White House by a Secret Service agent on 9-11. And I, you know, I had the realization that when my dad was being rushed into the bunker under the White House on September 11th, it was because Al-Qaeda, we were under attack from Al-Qaeda. And when Mike Pence was being rushed to safety in the Capitol, it was because a mob sent, mobilized by Donald Trump, was, was trying to kill him. And, and I think that's a, a very shocking realization. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other thing I would say that's different is after 9-11, Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives went out on the steps of the Capitol and sang God Bless America, and there was a, um, a unity about defending the country. Um, now, obviously, there were major policy debates uh, that took place and still take place today, but, but there was a moment after the attack when we were unified, mm -hmm. and... Um, What's happened after January 6th is um, not that kind of unity, but um, I think on some level it has um, woken people up mm -hmm. about the danger of toxicity and in, in how we treat each other and not descending to that level. But at the same time, I think that, um, you know, we have one political party today that uh, is... is you know, enthrall of a cult of personality, mm -hmm. and uh, and that is still a, a dangerous place for the country to be. So you you have said that you will do everything in your power to make sure that Donald Trump does not get near the Oval Office again, the White House again. Um, you know, your book I think lays it out pretty well. Uh, you've been a obviously a very effective spokesperson for um, why that would be a terrible thing. How do you plan to spend the next several months between now and Election Day 2024 to um, you know, further that cause? Well, I think there are several important things. Um, one is uh, I began in the 2022 cycle um, you know, for the first time ever uh, supporting a couple of Democrats. Mm -hmm. And um, these were candidates, two members that I had worked with closely um, in the House, um, Alyssa Slotkin, Alyssa Slotkin yeah. and uh, Abigail Spanberger, um, and both of whom, um, <laughs> both of whom, you know, we have policy disagreements on some issues, but, you know, I would trust them, and, right. and I know that they want to do the right thing for the country, and those are the kinds of, of people that we have to elect, so I'm going to mm -hmm work particularly hard to make sure we defeat election deniers, um, you know, down ballot, not just at the top of the ballot. Mm -hmm. And that's important because we could have a situation where this next election, 
uh, does not result in a presidential candidate getting 270 electoral votes, right. and it could get thrown into the House. And in my view, we cannot have the Republicans in charge in the House of Representatives if that happens. Right. And so... Um, I'm going to be uh, working hard to help elect good candidates, and, uh, and I'm going to be making a decision about exactly what role I plan to play in the presidential race okay. over the next couple of months. Okay. Um, just a, a couple more questions, and then we're going to turn it over to audience questions, and I guess you can maybe start lining up. At, there, there are a couple of mics and mic stands here. And, um, I, I just have to say one thing, sorry. Yeah. The last time that I was on a stage and people lined up in the aisles at microphones was when I was kicked out as the Republican conference <laughs> chair. <laughs> yeah, but you also got a standing ovation then after you left, you heard. Yeah. This was in the book. A after a lot of my male colleagues told me they didn't like my attitude. Yeah, yeah. they didn't like your tone. Yeah. I, by the way, I think your tone has been fine tonight. Thank you, I, thank I you. One of the things I'm always struck by in, in writing about politicians is how terrified so many of them are to lose. Mm -hmm. And in, in, this, in service to that, they will do all kinds of things to avoid losing, you know, what, what have you. What, what has it been like for you to lose? Because, to, to lose? No, because, I mean, you lost a year ago. Um, I, you know, I think you serve extremely honorably. Um, you know, your, your reputation nationally seems to be enhanced, albeit among MSNBC watchers. Um, <laughs> but no, you, you've, you've been, you know, you've, you've seemed to have thrived after Congress. I mean, what was that experience like and, and how has life been on the other side? You know, it, it's, I don't think that you can compare uh, what happened to me in 22, um, you know, with losing generally. I, I actually remember um, I was 10 years old, and my dad was President Ford's chief of staff, and, um, you know, that's the first campaign that I remember very well and, and was really, you know, emotionally engaged, and, and, and I remember how terrible it felt to lose, even, you know, as a 10-year-old. Um, I like Jimmy Carter a lot better now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think but, we all do. Yeah. But, uh, but, no, so losing, losing stinks. Nobody likes to lose. Mm -hmm. Uh, this time was it was different for me because it became clear that I at some point I had to choose either I was going to do what was necessary to keep my congressional seat or I, I was going to stand up for the truth and and so there wasn't really a question about what was going to happen but um, but I did think it was important to actually say in my concession speech that I had conceded the race. I thought that was that's a very important thing for losing yeah. candidates generally to yeah, do. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, no, no, note to self. Um, there, there's one scene in the book that I thought was really moving, and I wanted to quickly touch on it before we got to questions. Um, there was a scene where I, I think it was the night before, was it before January 6th, when your father came out to the car and said to you, anyway, t tell the story because it was really moving. So um, this was on New Year's Eve, uh, so December 31st, 2020. Mm -hmm. And we had just been through the process of working on the Secretary of Defense letter, the letter that was signed by all living Secretaries of Defense, because we were hearing about things that were happening at the Pentagon that were really concerning. And so, um, I worked with my dad and with Eric Edelman to get the living secretaries of defense to issue this public warning mm -hmm. to Chris Miller, who was the acting secretary, and to Donald Trump and to others about the use of the military um, in, in affecting the outcome of American elections. And um, as we had been working on that, uh, the next day we had lunch at my, my parents' house, and. When we were leaving, my dad came out, um, and I, he came around to where I was and um, on, on the passenger side of the car, and uh, he looked at me as, as he was saying goodbye, and he said to me, defend the republic, daughter. Hmm. And, and I said, I will, Dad, always. Yeah.
I, I need to start telling my daughters to defend the pub, to Republic more, daughter. Yeah. You know, I, just, I need to be better about it that. It has an never, impact. Never done it before. But, you know. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, why don't we? I mean, try to make. We'll try to do a lightning round thing because I think we have a lot of questions and we don't have that much time. So uh, we'll start there, then we'll go there, and we'll work our way through. Thank you, Miss um, Cheney. I have actually maybe 500 questions I'd like to ask you, but I'm not even going to ask you one. Instead, I know that as a representative in Congress, you have very little opportunity to read mail, and probably have even less of a likelihood to read mail from someone like me who's from Maryland. <laughs> so I would like to read you just a very short letter that I sent to you on January 13th, 2021, after your vote on impeachment. Dear Congresswoman Cheney, your vote on impeachment was right. Democracy cannot exist amongst lies from its leaders. Your vote on impeachment was difficult. Leadership is making the right decision in tough cases. Your vote on impeachment was honorable. Our founders pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. You will retain yours. I cannot say the same thing about others. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the, the outpouring of support and, um, and the comments like that, uh, I, I can't tell you how much they mean. And I know not just for me, but, but for you know, others who um, have done the right thing um, at, at all levels. And so you know, please know it really, it really makes a difference. And it's, it's it's really important to make sure that we're all helping to reinforce, um, you know, others who are doing the right thing as well, because uh, there's certainly a lot of loud voices on the other side. But thank you very much for reading that and, and for sending it. Thank you. I, I apologize because it's, we're I'm sure you're tired of hearing it, and it's on the same uh, vein as our, our, my, my uh, mate. And that is that I have to tell you that my family and I disagree with you on 90% of your policy <laughs> positions, but my sister and I are overwhelmed with gratitude and privilege and honor to tell you personally that you are our Shiro, you're an American treasure. And we thank you. And we thank you and your wonderful family for your courage, your strength, your integrity. We can't imagine what you and your family go through. And we are so, so grateful to you, you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, show of hands. How many people voted for Dick Cheney for vice president in 2004? <laughs> All right, we got that's a few. That's not fair. Hey, yeah, there's a couple. We, we got a few. Yeah, we <laughs> They're got a few. They're related to me, but. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sorry. Uh, all right, what's your shirt say? Faithful and fearless. That is one, of, that's a Team Cheney shirt oh. right there. All right. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to stand here and tell you all the ways I think you're wonderful because we don't have all week. Um, so all I'm going to say is that I think um, you're going to go down as one of the greatest patriots this country has ever known. Um, but I do also have a question. I'm a Midwestern Democrat, have been one all my life. Um, and I know that in the blue bubble, it's very easy for us to stand there and go, well, obviously, he's unfit and a danger to the country. Like, yeah, obviously. Um, but there's a lot of people who are hearing very different and they're not, we need to get the message out of the bubble. And as a Midwesterner, I know some of the reasons why so many of my fellow Midwesterners flit to, I mean, I'm from Indiana, we went for Obama in 2008 and then we went for Trump in 2016. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, to quote my forever candidate, Senator Amy Klobuchar, she said, a lot of Midwesterners are feeling left behind at the gas station, and we are. How do we get the message out of the bubble? How do we make people 
listen to say that yes, we understand, yes, there are things we need to change. Neither party is perfect, God knows. Um, I also disagree with you on basically everything not named Vladimir Putin. Um, but you are dead on on the message that there is so much more to this than a partisan struggle. And how do we cross-pollinate? Because we can't win this without working together. Yeah, it, it is uh, maybe the most important question that we're facing. And I think there are a couple of things uh, that, that really matter. One is um, to understand that, uh, that what Trump has done is, you know, partly what you're saying, he's tapped into um, people around the country, really good people in many cases, who feel like their voices aren't heard and, and convinced them that he would speak for them. And that's the con man aspect of it. And when I think about the, the, you know, the really good people across Wyoming um, who he's taken money from, who you know, these fundraising um, frauds that continue to go on to this day, um, and that he's convinced that if they're with him, you know, he'll help somehow bring this country back. And so I think one thing we have to do, and I think maybe the most important thing in terms of this next election is make sure that the independent voters um, know he's not the lesser of two evils, he's not an acceptable option, and, and those independents can, can never feel like, listen, you know what, we might not like what he did, but you know, we're worried about the economy or national security or whatever the issue is, and, and so we're gonna be with Trump. Um, and just by the way, uh, you know, the We've seen over the last few days um, performances uh, by some of Trump's strongest allies in Congress. Um, and I'm talking about Elise Stefanik. And her questioning of the presidents of those universities, the questioning, I think, was right. It was tremendous. The answers that she got from those presidents were disgraceful. Um, but. She is one of Donald Trump's staunchest supporters, and Donald Trump dines with Nick Fuentes, who is a Holocaust denier, who is somebody um, who, on a daily basis, um, calls for the elimination of Israel, and much worse. And so I think that making sure people understand that Donald Trump's um, allies, Donald Trump himself, um, are no friends of Israel or no, are no friends of the Jewish people, um, that that can't be a reason why people decide that they're going to go that way. But, but ultimately recognizing we aren't going to convince some of the hardest core supporters, um, but we can convince independents. And this goes back to those independents, though, have to have a place to go. And, and I don't know yet exactly where that place is going to be, but people have to know there's a choice that is not Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ooh, okay, it's very, very, very humbling to be in front of two exceptional people. My aunt got me, thank you for your servitude. I loved yeah. it. Um, thank you. And I'm sure that if I didn't get it today, yeah. she would have also gotten me oath and honor. Yeah. Um, so earlier you said that you endorsing any Republican candidate would probably make you lose votes. I want to ask you more of an optimistic question. Do you think that instead of 2016 there being a silent majority, now there is a silent plurality of Republicans who support you? They just don't do it, you know? They just don't know it? They just don't know it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, if you look at the polls um, among, for example, you know, these latest polls of Republican voters in Iowa, for example, there are as many Republicans who don't support Donald Trump as those who do. Now, the problem is, you know, that means that he's 30 points ahead or something um, among his closest uh, opponent. But I, I do believe that um, if you look at where his support is nationally among Republicans, there are more members of the party who understand that he's dangerous, who do not support him, than there are who do. Um, now, what that means, though, is we have to get those people mobilized. And, um, and we also, look, you know, uh, there are really big, important issues that the Democrats are not addressing right now. 
that are causing people to think, well, we might have to vote for Donald Trump, things like the border. And, and that's, you know, I, I, I have, uh, as Mark has pointed out, I have a lot more Democratic friends now than I used to have. And, <laughs> but I tell them, like, you guys have to not be crazy. Because if you're going to be crazy, you know, you're going to drive people to Trump. So there are some places like immigration policy where yeah. Yeah. we have to see some changes. Message to Democrats, don't be crazy. So, so. Uh, hi. Um, first, I agree with what everyone said about your courage and your honor. Um, you use the term personality cult, and that's uh, discussed quite a bit as if Donald Trump were the problem. But he was the Republican nominee in 2016. People knew what he was like, it was no secret. He ran his presidency in the way that many people feared. Um, there, um, despite the fact that there was January 6th, he's far and ahead of any other candidate. There aren't a lot of Republicans lining up um, to not just to challenge him, but to even say, maybe that's not right. And there are other ways in which the Republican Party is supportive of autocrats around the world. So is the problem one of personality, or did Donald Trump really sort of emulate what was happening in the Republican Party already, at least to some extent? Well, I think there are several things. One. Um, I think that many of us who supported him, um, many Republicans, thought, all right, he'll grow into the job. And I certainly thought that. You know, I had been around presidents. I understood how the White House works. I understood there are structures in place that help a president do his job, that most presidents, when they take office, um, they're sort of overwhelmed when they recognize the truly awesome power of that office and that that has an impact. Clearly, I was wrong. And um, so, I, you know, I, I think that um, certainly uh, there were um, reasons why uh, many of us, you know, wished that we had understood sooner and had not supported him. Obviously, I wish he had never been president. Um, and I think that you are right with respect to the autocratic um, connections going on right now. And, you know, the fact that you have so many vocal Republicans doing Putin's bidding with respect to Ukraine um, is, a, is a very troubling thing. I think you do actually have, you know, a, a Putin wing of the Republican Party right now. Um, but... But I also think that um, it's, it's wrong to say that, you know, somehow that's where the party has always been headed. Because certainly the people who are um, taking the party today down that path, for example, from a national security perspective, are doing something that Ronald Reagan could never have imagined. If you had told Ronald Reagan this is what the party will be doing on national security, uh, you know, he wouldn't have believed it. So something else is going on. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a convergence of factors. Uh, but, you know, it's a situation where Donald Trump has taken advantage of it. Donald Trump is also now teaching other politicians um, how they should operate. And, um, and in some ways, the people that I hold most responsible beyond Donald Trump are those Republican officials who know better, and that's most of them, who understand that he's dangerous and that he's lying and yet won't do anything. Those are the people that, that I think are most responsible for where we are. Take um, one more question from each microphone, and then the last two questions from the virtual audience. Okay, I was, oh, yeah, okay, well, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Nathan Weisler, and my question is, um, in starting to read the book, I saw your reference, I saw your reference in the photo section to um, 
to your memories of President Ford. And my question is, um, what do you think is particularly important for future generations to know about President Ford and his leadership and the contributions that he made at the time he was in office? Well, I have a very um, a soft spot in my heart for President Ford. Um, you know, I, I knew him when I was a little girl and um, knew him as a good man. And now understanding the role that he played um, and the way that he served the country. And, you know, he was fundamentally a man of character and decency. And, and we have had presidents of character and decency on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, and those are the kinds of people that, that we should be electing. Um, and, and people who didn't, didn't vilify their political opponents. And again, this is some place where I think all of us who've been involved in politics for some time are guilty of vilifying our opponents to some extent. And, and I think we all have to do a much better job at realizing the country's better off if we're debating substance and policy and not engaged in personal attacks. First, I want to thank you and your family for your service. Um, it's, we're very grateful to you. Um, the, the parallels in history are, are just, they made my blood ice. Um, and I'm thinking 90 years ago, 90 years ago, um, when someone had come to power, was kicked out of power, and came back with a vengeance. So my, one of the things that troubles me the most is the humble voter, which we have to put our trust in for the next election, um, is one thing, but people do tend to act tribally. The more important thing for me are the changes in the legislation that have been going on. And I think you pointed out in the early part of your book about the Electoral College. Um, and the question in my mind is, and what are you, is what are you hearing is happening on the ground? Um, what kind of mischief is happening? Will we be faced with a legitimized uh, second group of electors? Um, and where do we go from there? Well, uh, so I think with respect to the um, Electoral Count Act, uh, you know, this, one thing that's really important to remember, uh, in Congress, uh, just as, the, as my term was ending, we actually passed reforms to the Electoral Count Act. Now, Donald Trump says, that what he was doing was legal under the previous bill, and that's why we had to reform it, which, of course, is absolutely wrong. What he did was illegal under the initial, the previous Electoral Count Act is illegal under the current Electoral Count Act and unconstitutional. Um, but we did take steps to help to clarify situations in which, um, you know, for example, state officials could attempt to delay elections um, and and the House bill in that regard was better in my view than the Senate bill, but, but the, the, there has been improvements. Um, having said that, uh, there's no um, legislative fix to a president who will attempt to blow through the guardrails of democracy. And so, we have to do everything we can to make sure that um, you know, we, we have put in place uh, legislation that can anticipate what might happen, but this goes back to the point we were discussing earlier, which is that individuals at the end of the day um, matter. And so in each um, state, looking at the races that involve secretaries of state, governors, individuals who will have the ability to determine whether they want to certify an election or not. Um, we have to make sure we don't elect people who are only going to respect the elections if they agree with the outcome. And that's incumbent upon voters all across the country. Um, and we have to, what I find too often is that what's happening today with respect to Donald Trump is people are exhausted by it and they don't, they don't want to have to deal with it because it's, 
it's so dire. And what I can tell you is the people that are pushing Donald Trump and the people who are working to try to get him elected, working to elect people who support him all up and down the ballot, they're really organized and they're, they're energized. And so if those of us who understand how dangerous he is decide, you know what, it's just too complicated or too painful or we can't be involved, then we risk that they'll prevail. And so it, you know, we're in a situation in our, in our democratic process where um, every voter has to be accountable for finding good candidates, for supporting them, for putting your own name on the ballot, um, for running, uh, because the, the, what we know for sure is the process itself will, will crumble if people don't get active and engaged in, in stopping what he's trying to do. The other thing I would say is, um, it, it is a, it's a very real thing that foreign actors, adversaries, will attempt once again um, to intervene in our elections. And so we have to take that threat very seriously as well um, and you know, do everything that we can at the local level, at the state level, and nationally uh, to protect our systems against that kind of foreign intervention. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to take a couple of questions from our virtual audience uh, for Liz. Uh, I guess I'll start with Katie from Washington State. Um, who or what has led to the sense of integrity that you have? Um, I don't agree with you on anything politically. Don't, why do they always have to include that caveat? I mean, we get it. You don't agree with her on anything. All right, theme. great. Um, <laughs> But you are full of integrity and character, and you spread truth to power, and I admire you for that. Thank you. Um, so I guess the original question was, who or what has led to the sense of integrity that you have, Liz? <laughs> well, Katie might not like this answer, um, but Dick Cheney. Um, and, and Lynn Cheney, who I'm sure is watching, and so... <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, is, it, it is really true um, that watching uh, my parents and watching my dad go through particularly, you know, periods of time when, um, you know, uh, people were saying things that weren't very nice about him, uh, and, and understanding uh, what it means to have the courage of your convictions, and I think also the fact that my mom and dad really cared that Mary uh, and I understood history and, and read history and knew the history of the country. Um, but, but I also, I, I think that it's important to say that um, they're, they're hard questions to answer because it, it doesn't, there was not a moment where I thought, should I do this or should I do that? because it seems to me that it's obvious what had to be done. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also uh, uh, humbling and, and um, very moving, um, but, but I, I also think it's not, it's not courage, um, mm -hmm. because you know, if you think about people that landed at Normandy, that's mm -hmm. courage. You think about people that have made tremendous sacrifices um, in war, that is courage. Um, th the last couple of years have been about about duty and what's required, um, and I, I think that's that's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. um, my my wife is in the audience, so she can attest to this. I, I did a profile of Dick Cheney about twenty years ago, and I came home and. She looked at me and said, all right, what was he like? And I said, you know, it was kind of a trip. Um, there was a, we were touring, he was touring the new Air and Space Museum over by Dulles Airport, because and John Travolta was there for some reason. And Dick Cheney walks around a corner and he's got his detail, and there is John Travolta. And guess which one of them was really starstruck in that moment? It was not John Travolta. Or it was not Dick Cheney. It was John Travolta. It was like, oh my gosh. And I don't think your dad knew who John Travolta was <laughs> in that moment. Anyway, that concludes. And John the, Wayne, he would have known. John Wayne, yes. Yeah. That, 
That concludes the John Travolta section of this uh, talk. <laughs> um, Lisa from Potomac asks, did participating in the January 6th hearings change your perception of yourself personally, and did it change your perception of this country in any way? You know, it, it, um, it gave me tremendous hope um, when I saw the, you know, sitting there when Cassidy Hutchinson walked out alone to testify, mm -hmm. or Sarah Matthews, um, you know, Rusty Bowers, hearing the stories of these people who did the right thing was very inspirational. Um, you know, working with um, Adam Schiff and uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and Zoe Lofgren, members that I didn't know, um, certainly changed my perspective and I think probably changed theirs. I know they thought it was weird to be working with me. Um, but, but so it did. It also, I think all of us stopped more than once and said, you know, we're operating in a nonpartisan fashion and we also aren't, you know, trying to one-up each other when the television cameras are on and we're trying to score political points. And our staff was essentially totally, you know, from a partisan perspective, integrated. I didn't know the party affiliation of the vast majority of the investigators. Mm -hmm. um, they were career prosecutors. Um, there were senior Republicans that I brought on senior Democrats too, but, but that's, that's how congressional committees you know, ought to work. Right. And, and so I think that, that was eye-opening for me, certainly. So, um, so we, we've gone over a little bit. I, I just wanna say, before we wrap up, um, Liz, it's been just an honor and a privilege to uh, share the BEMA with you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sentence I never thought I was gonna say. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, again, everyone should read the book and you should, if you haven't bought it yet, buy it at Politics and Prose and buy all your books at Politics and Prose. And um, Liz, I, I you know, look forward to see what you're going to do next because this is um, obviously extremely important. I don't think there's anything more important right now in this country, maybe in this world. So uh, thank you for what you've done thank and you. what you will do. In thank the you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you can please stay standing.